Good morning, everybody. Thanks for watching. So I'm going to do a little study um, through the book of Romans here um, in my next few videos. I'm going to start with Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3 here, written by the Apostle Paul. And um, just I'm going to pull some things out. I mean, it's very hard to hit on everything, but I just kind of want to make an overview um, of some of the things that jumped out at me as reading through it again um, and studying it a bit. The first in chapter one, Paul talks about faith obedience. You know, faith obedience is what? Well, it's obedience to the faith, right? To the faith that he's going to be talking about here. And he goes on in chapter one to really... Um, you know, I, I think it's a argument against evolution and human free will here in chapter 1. Where we go through chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. I'm not going to read it all. Um, you guys can read it on your own if you want, and I'm sure you've, you've read over it before. But in verse 20, it says, For his invisible attributes are decried or decreed, decried from the creation of the world being apprehended by his achievements besides his imperceptible power and divinity now you talk about people that deny God's existence and their ridiculous belief in evolution that has been completely disproven and I'm not going to get into all that here but they're they're people who who would you know throw a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle in a room just scatter it everywhere and then shut the door and come back later that night and the puzzle is completely put together perfectly and they think that that just happened by chance that no intelligent person came in there and solved the puzzle or they're walking through the beach and they see a um, a Ferrari out in the middle of the beach and they think that that just appeared out of nowhere that there's nothing intelligent that created and put that order into that car because design has an order and a presence that you can see in everyone and everything you know your eyes how they work your heart and your body the complex nature of how things just operate they don't just spontaneously form or as evolutionists say just add billions and billions of years to it then somehow this order will come into being somehow all the stars will rotate and where you see one star a year later you'll see that exact same star and there's perfect order and you know, the north star stays here and it goes on and on the beauty of a smile, laughter, love. How does that stuff evolve? And that's, I think, what Paul's getting at here. Like, you have no excuse. Okay. And this excuse, like, okay, evolutionists run from God because they can't believe in a God that tortures people in hell for all eternity. Okay, and I get that. Of course, people are going to run from a God like that. Is a psychotic, but they don't, they don't bother to take the time to look and see if what religion says about God is true. They just throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, it, on a certain level, I sympathize more with um, people that don't believe in God at all I guess because at least they cannot accept the bogus God of Christianity that he's love and he'll reward you and love you as long as you love him back and if you don't love him back or do what he says then he's going to burn you in fire for all eternity and then they sit back and accept that as love that's what Christians do so I, I, I understand and respect people that run from that because it's false 
But these people then embrace an idea that's so ridiculous that somehow perfect order comes out of complete chaos and randomness as opposed to some intelligent design. So what evolutionists do and those that don't believe in intelligent design, they just throw the baby out with the bathwater and ignore these senses and the things around them that completely prove that God is the creator of all. And then Paul goes into talking about how in verse 25 they offer divine service to the creature rather than the creator. So now I think that turns it could be, you know, evolutionists or people that don't believe in God, they worship other humans or um, what people do as the final say and that people create all these things because they do it on their own. But also in the religious sense that people choose their own destiny. Yeah, Christ Jesus died on the cross, but it's up to you to make the right choice. So ultimately it's the creature that deserves praise and worship in order for uh, because they save themselves and of course Christians don't admit that but if Jesus Christ died for you and you chose him so you're saved and someone else did not choose him so they're not saved then it is your choice that saves you so you can get the credit you can boast you can't have it both ways and so Paul, going back to Acts 17 here, I relate Acts 17 to Romans chapter 1 here where he says to the barbaric Greeks that didn't worship the one true God, didn't know him, he says that in him you live and move and are. And he gives you life, breath, and all. And he gives it to all. And we cannot give him anything that he has first not given to us as if, as if he's attended by human hands as if God reacts to his creation and that's what's being said in Romans chapter 1 I believe like God reacts that's what all religion is and all Christianity is is that God reacts to your decision towards Christ or your decision on how much you sin or how much you follow the law. So God is a reactive God. So that, in another sense, is worshiping the creature because the creature dictates what God can and cannot do as opposed to the other way around, which is, which is true, of course. So Paul's kind of setting that scene here in Romans chapter 1. And then Romans chapter 2, and I... I've had this verse thrown at me a couple times saying that God judges us based on our acts. And, you know, after the thousand year kingdom, when people are judged at the great white throne, they're judged according to their acts. Some will go into the new earth. Some will go into the lake of fire. So there is a judgment of acts coming but is that what Paul's getting at in his first three chapters here in his letter to the Romans because in chapter 2 it does say God will pay each according to their acts those by endurance and good acts are seeking glory honor and incorruption life aeonian those that don't do these good acts they won't get that reward but then Paul goes on to talk about in verse 13 chapter 2 verse 13 that the doers of the law will be justified that those that don't have law by nature do what the law demands and have the action of the law written on their hearts this is verses 25 through 29 so Paul is kind of setting up the standard here okay if you do good acts and you follow the law then you have this great reward and if you don't do these things 
then you won't have this reward. But here's the thing. Paul is saying this is how God operates. But he's setting the bar so high that it cannot be obtained. That's what Paul is saying that God is doing here. It's not that he's saying you have to do these good acts and that's how you earn your righteousness. And if you don't do these good acts, you're not going to get this righteousness or you're going to be out of the Onian kingdom. That's not what he's saying. He's setting the bar. God is. Yes, you have to do this in order to get that reward. But guess what? Nobody can do it. That's what Paul's doing here in chapter 2. It's like a 50-foot basketball hoop. Say there's a basketball hoop. A, a normal basketball hoop is 10 feet. There's a 50-foot basketball hoop. And God's saying, all you need to do to get Aeonian life or get your reward is dunk a basketball with no help on a 50-foot rim. That's all you have to do. That's the standard, okay? He's not changing that. The righteousness of the law, God's righteousness, the 50-foot basketball hoop. No one can attain it. No one can dunk on it. It's still the standard. You have to do it to get the life that I promised you. You have to do it. It's just that nobody can do it. Everybody's shut up and locked up into not being able to do that. And that's the same with God's righteousness when it comes to the law. And that's what Paul's setting up here. So now as he goes on, there's one that can dunk on a 50-foot rim and he just brings us with him through his faith to bring us in. And that's what Paul's going to get into here. So Romans chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. It says, For there is no partiality with God. For whoever sinned without law, the Greeks, right? Because Israel got the law, the Jews got the law. So forever sinned without law, without law also shall perish. And whoever sinned in law, Israel, the Jews, through law will be judged. So those without law who sinned will perish. And those in law who sinned will be judged. For not the listeners to law are just with God, but the doers of law should be justified. So the doers of law should be justified. Keep that in mind. Okay? Now again, I'm going to say this again because it's going to lead into my next point. There's no partiality with God. Whoever sinned without the law, the Greeks without the law should perish. So if you sinned without the law, you will perish. And if you sinned in law, you will be judged. So if you sin, one sin in law, you're judged. One sin without the law, you perish. So who's included in these two groups? Well, let's look at Romans 3, 9 through 11. What then are we privileged? Undoubtedly not, for we previously charged both Jews and Greeks to be all under sin. All under sin. So the Greeks, without the law, they sinned, they'll perish. The Jews, with the law, they sinned and will be judged. both Jews and Greeks, to be all under sin. So who's not included here? Nobody's not included. It's everybody. And if that's not enough, Paul goes on to say in verse 11, not one is just. Remember, this is Jews and Greeks. Those that didn't have the law, those that do have the law, neither of them, none of them, none of them, none of them are just. Not one. 
Not one is just, not even one. Not one is understanding, not one is seeking out God. So there's the bar. Yeah. The doers of the law. Do God's law perfectly. And if you sin once, Scripture says if you sin in one little iota of the law, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. So the standard is, yeah, you do the right thing all the time. You achieve God's righteousness, then here's your reward. But no one can achieve God's righteousness. No one can dunk on a 50-foot rim. That's still the standard. It's just that none of you can get there. And that's proven over and over and over in Scripture. And that's the theme, a theme that goes through this entire book. Is that God does it, not man. Salvation is of God. As we look down here, verse 20. The just verdict of God, this is chapter 3. Because by works of law, no flesh at all shall be justified in his sight. For through law is the recognition of sin. So, so much for the doers of the law shall be justified. The doers of the law shall be justified. And then in verse 20 here it says, By works of law, no flesh at all shall be justified. So if you do the law, you'll be justified. Do the law. Dunk on the 50-foot rim. And you're justified. That's all you need to do. You know, jump over the moon. That's all you have to do. Swim across the ocean. That's all you have to do. Do the law. Perfectly. No one can do it. God is shutting up everybody. No, not one is just, not even one, because no one can do the law. Everyone shut up in the exact same place. There's no partiality with God. That's what Paul's saying here. So there it is. There's the standard. Do the law. And if you don't do the law and you sin, you perish. And if you're in law and you don't do the law, then you're judged. So everybody's locked up in it. But that's still the standard. It's just nobody can do it. Sorry, God set the bar so high that no one can achieve it. But it still needs to be done. And then Paul clears his throat from Romans 3.21 and tells you now how it's done. So these arguments in Romans chapter 2, which I have Christians come up and had a pastor explain this to me. See, look, in, in Romans chapter 2, look at all the acts you have to do as if you have to follow the law perfectly. Okay, you're not understanding the context at all of what Paul's saying. He's not saying... You have to achieve this in order to get God's righteousness. He's saying the bar is here. Yeah, you have to do it to get God's righteousness, but you can't do it. The pastor is explaining how he can do it and how people can do it based on a bar that God has set that no one can do. That's why Israel went through all that they went through, never being able to follow the law. Why? To show the recognition of sin and the need for a Savior. As it says in Romans 3.20, it's not to follow it perfectly, like the religionist says. It's to set up the bar to know that you can't get there, and now I'm going to tell you how to get there, or how it's done. And this is what Paul does in 3.21, Yet now apart from law, apart from law, apart from you doing the law to be justified, apart from that, a righteousness of God is manifest because you can't get to the righteousness of God by following the law. Not one is justified. No flesh at all should be justified by works of the law. It's what he just said. Yet now apart from the law, a righteousness of God is manifest, being attested by the law and the prophets, yet a righteousness of God through Jesus Christ's faith. For all and on all who are believing, for there is no distinction Remember, we're all shut up in sin. For all sinned and are wanting of the glory of God. So this is both Jew and Greek. These are those that 
are without the law, those that are in the law, those that perish, those that are judged, they're all in sin. As Romans 3.10 says, they're all under sin. We're all under sin. We all can't get to the standard of righteousness of God, so Jesus Christ's faith gives us that righteousness of God. It's for everyone, and eventually everybody will realize this because it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. As Paul says in chapter 2, So if there's no partiality with God, then that means he's going to work in everybody to eventually come to a realization of what Christ Jesus has done and the fact that each and every person will get God's righteousness based on what Christ did. Verse 24, being justified gratuitously in his grace through deliverance which is in Christ Jesus. That word gratuitously is used in John 15:25. D-O-R-E-A-N, I think it's Strong's word, 1432, where it talks about how people hated Jesus gratuitously for no reason. There was no reason in Jesus, check out John 15:25, for the people to hate him. Well, in the exact same way, we're justified. There's nothing within us that would make us justified. Christian wants to say that, oh, you have to follow law, you have to do something in order to distinguish you, yourself, in order to be distinct. Verse 23, there is no distinction, God says, but religion tries to make themselves distinct and present themselves to God as if they have something within them to give to God so they're worthy when someone else is not. God gives you the faith. God gives you what you need in order to be saved. Salvation is all of God. So when you're saved, if you have belief now or, or later, whatever action you do is God causing you to do it. Otherwise, if it was you doing it, there would be a distinction. There would be a work of yourself. It wouldn't be gratuitously. There'd be something in you that you presented to God that someone else didn't. As if there was something in Jesus that was worthy of hatred. As John 15, 25 uses that word gratuitously, meaning there is nothing in him to be hated, but people hated him. So if you're saying that you do something to be saved, then you're saying basically with the usage of that word that there was something in Jesus that was worthy of hatred. But there's not anything in Jesus that was worthy of hatred for those people in John 15, 25. Just like there's nothing within us that we present to God that he hasn't given to us first that makes us worthy of being justified. We're justified by Christ Jesus, by his death, his entombment, and his resurrection. And then God, because we don't distinct ourselves or separate ourselves from anybody else, there's no distinction, then God chooses when that death, entombment, and resurrection will ultimately deliver us and apply to us. Because it's for everyone. It's on all those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10 God is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. If it's on you, you have that special salvation. But if it's not on you at the moment, it's for you. And God will work just like he does in those that he chooses first. He will work out your salvation. You'll work out your salvation in fear and trembling because it's God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you will live your life just like everybody else, but it's God that's working in you to will and to do, eventually leading up to all that die in Adam being alive in Christ. So there's no boasting in verses 27 and 28. 
For to him to be just and to justify the one who is of the faith of Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is debarred. Through what law? Of works? No, but through faith's law. For we are reckoning a man to be justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the ultimate salvation here. If you had faith or you did good works or you did something that someone else didn't do, you can boast in that. If you did something and someone else didn't do it and that act caused you to be saved and God had to react to it and save you when he didn't save the other one because they didn't do it, you can boast in that. Well, why are you saved? Well, I made this choice. Well, I followed the law. Well, I did good works. But you can't boast in it. It's the bard because salvation is all of God. And um, I'll start with chapter 4 in my next video. Thank you.